Good afternoon. So today I'm going to present the talk on the non-equilibrium thermodynamics from force principles. So I'm doing a PhD at the Russia Polytechnic Institute in physics and my specialization is statistical mechanics for all the equilibrium systems. And uh, last time at uh, Polytechnico in Italy on a visiting position. Uh, with the Department of Energy. So, in this talk, I'm going to present some of the ideas which we developed over a period of one year, last one year. So, before going into that, I would uh, discuss some of uh, the issues that uh, I presented, the ideas that I presented in my first talk in 2013. So, uh, this was a talk which I presented in 2013. The title was The Physical Foundations of Self-Organizing Systems. There are a lot of ideas, quite speculative ideas, but not any fundamentally grounded. But it did uh, lay a couple of, uh, I would say, the foundations for the current talk. So the key ideas that I presented there is the non-symmetrical distribution of event states at energy when the system is wildly out of equilibrium. Because in equilibrium systems, we have the nice uh, normal distribution of states and energy. The Gaussian distribution or uh, the Boltzmann distribution in case of the partition function. But if we find out the energy, it has the uh, momentum and the uh, potential energy, and the momentum is uh, quadratic. So we essentially end up with the uh, normal distribution in the momentum space. And the self organization and entropy, how they are connected. And the I, I was speaking about. Uh, a variational approach to quantify self-organization by using least action or the stationary action principle. Those were the ideas that I had presented. Now, what are the difficulties in them? Uh, difficulty is, the, first of all, there are huge number of distribution functions. So, how do I say that this is something which is describing complexity? Because we know we have power uh, law, we have poison processes, we have exponential uh, decays then self-organization is still not fully defined in terms of theoretical understanding. Like we do not have a set of equation which is telling what is self-organization. However, we have some approaches where it talks about the information aspect and it tries to connect it to the Shannon entropy. But still, there are few uh, still areas which are still to be explored. So which we will see in uh, the, the next slides. And the stochastic nature of the dynamics of any physical process, a real physical process, kind of makes things very difficult because action principle or variational mechanics, they are all for deterministic systems. And complex systems or systems which are out of equilibrium, it's just not possible to use them. If we can do then it's not complex anymore because then it is a deterministic, fully functional system. So these are the difficulties. So before going into the non-equilibrium uh, thermodynamics, I would just lay out the equilibrium thermodynamics. So it's very uh, it's very useful for closed systems and for open systems under certain cases when we have uh, balances of the fluxes of energy and flows. And uh, in equilibrium thermodynamics, the time symmetry is there. So we have um, the energy conservation, of course. And entropy is a stationary quantity. That means that it achieves, there are fixed points in space, in the phase space. And one of those fixed points is uh, entropy, uh, where we have the maximum entropy for the closed systems. And for isolated systems, we know that the entropy is just increasing with time from the second law. So this points in phase spaces where uh, the entropy is ach achieves a stationary value, they are the local attractors which towards which the system wants to gradually degrade to. And the second law talks about the entropy increase, but it doesn't say that how it should increase and what is the dynamic associated with it. A simple model for uh, equilibrium thermodynamics is like we have two uh, partitions, uh, we have a partition and it's divided into two molecules, red and green and particles and then when you remove the partition, you can have all these possible states and each one of them is identical and you don't know uh, which
which happened earlier or which happened later. This is a problem. And in equilibrium thermodynamics, energy is the state function of each point in the uh, phase space. The first law is the energy balance equation, which is basically heat minus work is the internal energy of a system. And the second law is the heat entropy equivalence for a reversible process where the entropy change and temperature with the reservoir is the heat exchanged. So, an equilibrium statistical mechanics. Uh, we have whatever the statistical mechanic formulations right now, it's for equilibrium systems. Energy is still a state function. The statistical distribution is the Boltzmann distribution, which is the exponential beta uh, E, which is the Hamiltonian of the system. And Z is the partition function, that is the total number of possible states that a system can be in. And the Hamiltonian is the kinetic and potential energy. And Hamiltonian is uh, used everywhere in physics because it's a total energy and it's very easy to visualize as a total energy. Now, if we go to a non equilibrium thermodynamics, uh, energy still remains a state function, but time starts to play a crucial role. And what comes into account is the rate of change of quantities or the flows, how they are. Uh, introduced in the equations. A technical difficulty is defining the partition function in non-equilibrium thermodynamics because system is always evolving with time and so there will be a normalization and renormalization of the partition function of the state space over and over again because <laughs> the system is evolving with time. And this is a key difficulty which still remains an open question. So we go for the Lagrangian uh, as a principle, as a idea to uh, lay out the foundations. Lagrangian is basically kinetic minus potential. And the motivation to use a Lagrangian or uh, a variational approach to any kind of uh, mechanics or any kind of physics ideas is that this is very fundamental. It's even more fundamental than the Hamiltonian concept. And all of your physics and all of the equations can be derived from the action principle. And most importantly, Lagrangian gives us a path distribution approach. So we can find out how system A, uh, system from state A to state B evolves and what are the possibilities of the paths. And we can find out the distribution of the paths and see which, are, which paths are uh, most likely to be taken <coughs> and which are, which are completely not possible. So it gives us a lot of independence to uh, look at the same problem from a different angle. So Lagrangian is basically, uh, I would call it, it's a map from a phase diagram to a phase space. So this is a simple figure where we can see that uh, on the left side we have the pressure and the volume, which is a typical PV diagram in thermodynamics with the adiabatic curves and the isothermal curves. And the work done is basically along the path because it's a path function as PDV. And the same thing we can map it to a momentum uh, position space for an equilibrium case because uh, rate of change of momentum is a force and because time is, a, uh, is not a very significant thing in equilibrium thermodynamics, we can call it a characteristic time of a system and we can <coughs> do it as a force per uh, a force uh, times the distance which is again a work. So what happens is PDQ is uh, the abbreviated action which is also known as uh, Maupertuis form of action principle and T is the characteristics time which the inverse is the frequency. So for a cyclic reversible process where the internal energy is zero because the state of the system is uh, from A to B and again from B to A, so the change in internal energy is zero. The work done is essentially some frequency times the PDQ in the phase space, which is PDV in, uh, in the case of uh, uh, equilibrium thermodynamics. So there is a, this is just an example to illustrate the equivalence between phase space approach and a phase diagram approach and how the things are connected. And Lagrangian is kinetic minus potential energy, which is usually represented as the coordinate, velocity, and time as a function of. 
and the action is a functional which is the integral of the Lagrangian over time and uh, so A is what I call the usual action which is the LDT and J is the abbreviated action which is the Mopartois form of action which is PDQ and both essentially... Oh, sorry, I didn't get the J, the, why is it the abbreviated action? It's just named as abbreviated action. Ah. And uh, we have the Hamiltonian Jacobi equation which says that the time rate change of the action plus the total uh, Hamiltonian is conserved. So it's for a, a system where we do not have time dependence of the Hamiltonian. If the Hamiltonian is independent of time, so that means the energy is conserved in time. So for any system which is non-dissipative. So these two actions, the action and the abbreviated action, they should achieve the stationary value at the same point. So you have in so uh, this essentially claims that there is only and only one unique path. Whether you look in the PQ uh, phase space or if you look in the temp uh, time versus energy phase space. So velocity time or PQ uh, time. PQ phase space, you have the same unique path because the action goes to zero uh, in the same way for conservative systems where the Hamiltonian is independent with respect to time. And when the action is extremum, entropy is also extremum. This is for the isolated systems or closed systems <coughs> because, uh, as I said earlier, that entropy and the uh, entropy, uh, maximum entropy states are like fixed points in the phase space and they are like the attractors. So if you have to go from one state which is, uh, say, at a, which is not at an equilibrium state, whereas a state which is at equilibrium state, the way to go from that A to B has to be a unique path. And that's what we, that's why we have uh, phase diagrams, we have phase paths like the isobaric paths, the adiabatic paths, which are unique paths. Certain quantities are constant. We have the temperature constant from going from A to B in case of isotopes. So the entropy and uh, the change in entropy, the change in action and all these things are related very intimately with each other. But is it action a uh, variable that characterizes parts while entropy characterizes states of phases? Yes, yes. So entropy will characterize the state of phases, but if you go from one state to another, it has to have a unique path to go from there. And that will characterize from the action approach, that we have one path along which the temperature is constant, and that is an isotope. Uh, you mean that the when the action is extremum, you, yes. have a, you have a part where the entropy does not increase or does not decrease. Yeah, so entropy mm. is achieving it's a constant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so this, this entire thing was the introduction part and now I introduce an idea of the principle of equivalence, uh, an analogous principle in thermodynamics. So in relativity what we have is for any isolated observer, the inertial and the non-inertial frames are the same. You will not have any distinction between an inertial and a non-inertial frame. In thermodynamics, for an isolated observer, the states which are a system which is at thermal equilibrium and a system which is out of equilibrium but at steady state, the observer will not be able to understand the difference between them. If the observer is, can only make certain measurements, like if we consider some thermodynamic state variables, say temperature, in case of an equilibrium system, the fluctuation, uh, they die off as the square root of 1 by n. And in the thermodynamic limit, the fluctuations essentially they die out and the temperature of this room is the average temperature. In case of out of equilibrium system, which is at a steady state where the flows and everything is balanced, the fluctuations are very, they usually die off after some time because it has reached a steady state. So the temperature of this room, if I suddenly open this window, there will be a flux. But after some time, it will die off. So, but the state is still out of equilibrium. If I open this door and if I open this window and if I have balance of fluxes, the average temperature of the room remains the same. So. But both the systems are different. One is a system which is isolated, which is closed, no flows, and this is a system which has flows, but 
both are identical. Or for an observer which who does not know that the doors and windows were open, this system is equivalent to a closed system. So this is an interesting idea which I explore in this talk. So what does this mean? Because steady state out of equilibrium systems complex uh, they exhibit complex patterns. For example, the Rayleigh Bernard cells where we have input of energy and we have export of energy. But what happens is we have certain exotic patterns on the film of the liquid or the fluid. And we do not have any theories to quantify this uh, presence of these patterns. Like if you uh, look for the equations which talk about the open systems and the energy balances and fluxes, we talk about the time dependent changes. We don't talk about the spatial dependence as to how the energy is distributed. We say that the rate of energy of coming in and the rate of energy of going out is balanced. But how is it distributed? We don't know. So this is a problem and uh, this idea of principle of equivalence essentially attacks on this particular issue. And so definitely what we need right now is a new theory and with certain corrections to the energy balance equations to account for complexity. And this is the uh, basis of the entire talk. So, I start from points and I go to fields. So I don't uh, look at individual points or the coordinates as to what is X, Y, Z. But I talk about certain observables, thermodynamic observables like temperature, which is a thermal field. It can be viewed as a thermal field. And each point in space will have some temperature which has the function of x, y, z and the time. So this also gives us an uh, easy way to connect to already established field theories. So we have the quantum field theory, we have the classical field theories, we have the general relativity and these are all established and if we can come up with a field theory approach for thermodynamics, people have done that and uh, we can easily connect them together. Because we already have a lot of sophisticated math with us. So we define a thermodynamic Lagrangian to uh, solve this problem. And as I said, the thermodynamic scalar, the observable that I'm uh, interested in, and this is, the, uh, very, this is something which can be easily measured, the temperature or something. So temperature is basically a map which takes each point on the manifold which is a surface to some real value and because this is a scalar quantity so we have only scalar values the temperature can give to and the Lagrangian density which is the Lagrangian divided by the volume is uh, written as we uh, this is what we uh, represent it as as temperature times the entropy minus phi which is the potential, the potential of field, the potential of any kind of work forces like PDV work or new DN work, anything. And so the TS is basically the analog for the kinetic energy, the dissipative effects. If we have uh, molecules, so they are constantly in random motion, so they are dissipating it. And phi is the potential, which is the energy which is kept within them. And the Lagrangian density is what I wrote uh, right here, and the action is basically the time integral and the Lagrangian. And so what we do is we minimize the action. So if we want to minimize the action, that means we are solving for the variational integral. So we are solving for the euler lagrange equation of motion for such a system. So the euler lagrange equation for a field is what I represent there. And in one dimension and only one time coordinate, we have the form of the uh, uh, Euler-Lagrange equation. And we use a linear approximation at length and time scales in case of out of equilibrium systems which are at steady state. And so if, we, if there is one point in space, uh, the temperature in the neighborhood, the derivative of the, the spatial derivative of the temperature in the neighborhood essentially is t by some characteristic length scale. And the same is with the temporal derivative of the temperature. So if we solve this entire, I, have, I haven't put the entire equations and the way to solve it, but 
if we solve these equations, what we get is a, a first order correction to the first law, which is Ts minus phi, which is your heat minus work plus potential, which is the first law, plus the spatial derivative of the entropy and the spatial derivative of the field and the temporal derivative of the entropy and the temporal derivative of the field is equal to zero. And you can see there are two constants, the L, X and tau. They are the characteristic constants of length and time scale. And these two independent parts, the second and the third one, so the second part emphasizes on the distribution, spatial distribution of energy and spatial distribution of the entropy. And the third part tells you about the temporal distribution. So one is like the force and another one is the power dissipation. And each individually is energy conservation law. So in case of uh, systems which are at equilibrium, we do not have any flow, so the second and the third part, they, they go away, so we are only left with the first law. But in out of equilibrium systems which are achieve steady state, we can come up with these two characteristic constants for any physical system. And we can in, extrapolate that for the kth order corrections and it very nicely expands as the kth order length and temporal connections to the first law. Two uh, points which I would like to emphasize here. One is the usual description of Lagrangian, if we go back. This one is, Lagrangian is usually defined as coordinates and velocity and time. But in our representation, we define Lagrangian as a function of temperature and the derivatives of temperature. So this is one thing which uh, people haven't done. People have come up with field theories for thermodynamics where they have the usual mechanics approach and they map it to thermodynamics and they do it q, q dot and t. What I have done here is I have put in a field approach and I have put in temperature instead of that. And the benefit of using that is we the energy conservation emerges out of it straight away. So that essentially means that there should be some symmetry properties. And we have the symmetry property because in case of equilibrium systems and out of equilibrium steady state systems, time is again a symmetry because we don't know. So, and this is only for the first order correction. By that I mean we have only the first order derivatives of the temperature. So we don't have the square and the biotops. And in the kth order, we have the kth order derivatives. And what is the application? So Ts and phi explicitly, they derive the equation of, if we define Ts and phi explicitly, like Ts as the NFKBT, which is the equipartition energy of um, particles or molecules, and phi as PV, for example, in an ideal gas, we can actually come up with the equation of state by solving this Euler-Lagrange equation. By defining S for a one-dimensional Ising model, we can actually come up with, uh, we can recover the potential part as the field, the free energy degradation part, and the field uh, potential. Uh, for one-dimensional time-dependent heat equation, which is the uh, Laplacian of time uh, minus alpha times rate of uh, change of temperature is equal to zero, which is a Fourier's law of heat. If we solve it, we get the continuity equation back. And for a complex field, because these are all real values, but if we have a complex field where we have phi, which splits into phi and phi dagger, we get the Lagrangian density for the Schrodinger equation. So this, uh, this methodology uh, allows us to connect it to automatically to many areas of physics. And this is just a test of, I would say, sanity that things are working well. And the consequences of this, the consequences are the for any out of equilibrium system which is at a steady state which is showing some patterns we have a pair of characteristic constants l and tau and 
The interesting thing is these things can be measured. So, and every flow vector, uh, in, because in uh, systems which are out of equilibrium or in general systems which show patterns, we have some kind of flows. Like if we talk about the constructor law, the constructor theory, uh, Bejan talks about things which are flowing through the system. And uh, as time, with time, the system gives access to better and better flows. That's how we talk about evolution. But what is this flow? We don't know what is this flow. And this approach kind of gives us an idea to uh, come up with an intuition that, okay, what could this flow be? And in case of systems where the continuity equations hold true, the flow, the velocity vector is essentially uh, some kind of uh, operator form of something, like the momentum operator which we have in quantum mechanics. So here alpha is a diffusivity. So in case of uh, momentum operator, we have I h bar and the uh, derivative. And h bar is, h bar divided by mass is again uh, the same dimension as the diffusivity in case of quantum mechanics. So the velocity flow vector and the uh, momentum operator in, uh, in quantum mechanics, kind of they are analogous. And the time symmetry is maintained as I told you earlier and therefore the energy is conserved and presence of characteristic length scale also helps and helps us in defining a metric, a metric between two fluctuating states in the thermodynamic manifold. So this will also allow us to find the distance between two fluctuating states and how what is the probability that a system can go from state A to state B. So this idea essentially connects uh, this to the relativistic ideas, the general relativity where we can come up with an action and minimize uh, with respect to the metric formulation. And what are the limitations in this current theory? The limitation is it's it talks about one dimension homogeneous treatment. So we have temperature which varies as derivatives of x and t alone or higher orders. But it doesn't talk about uh, saddle point derivatives like we have del square t by del x del y or curl components. So these components will also give a tensorial uh, kind of uh, approach to this entire thing. So this will relate it to the stress energy momentum tensor in the future if we formulate it in that way. And Second is we assume that the field is symplectic, so it's continuous, it's smooth, and it's very differentiable every at every point in space. But so we do not account for discontinuous. We can have discontinuities. We can have heat sources and heat sinks where the field lines are converging. So how to tackle those things? We need some sophisticated methods. And it also does not take into account the transition from equilibrium to out of equilibrium state. It talks about two states which are fixed points in the phase space. One is equilibrium state, another one is equilibrium out of equilibrium state, but at steady state. We don't know how it goes from A to B. So this is one drawback of the current theory. And finally, we don't take into account the boundary conditions. If we have a system which is enclosed, which has proper boundary and it is exchanging heat with the reservoir, what happens at the boundary? We don't know. How the boundary effects change the heat flow and what are the effects of the non-conservative forces at the boundary, like dissipative effects. Because in case of uh, uh, systems which are dissipating, Hamiltonian is not essentially constant with time. We have some perturbative effects in the Hamiltonian. So future work basically is to fix all of those limitations. That's the first point. And at least try to. And the second is uh, it will open up some new approaches to study non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. As I told you earlier in the beginning of the talk that there are many open questions. We don't have a non-equilibrium uh, non formulation of statistical mechanics. And and the most important is to test the theory. This is a theory, but we don't have results. But there are many avenues to test this theory. So experimental variations of the Rayleigh-Bernard cells. 
So we are performing these experiments in our group. So where we are trying to make thermal images of the cells. And we can actually calculate how much work is being produced when the convection cells are formed. So we can find out the frequency and we can also find out how the distribution changes spatially from the images. So we can actually compute the characteristic length as well as the time scale for a system like that and how it is dependent with temperature, how it is dependent with heat flux. So that is one thing and second is simulations, multi-agent simulations or stochastic simulations and see how and where these length scales and time scales emerge out of them. We are still in the process of doing that. And the third thing is uh, from data, already established models and already established research like complex networks. For example, I did a very empirical calculation for uh, uh, spreads, uh, epidemic spreading in case of complex networks. So every complex network can be defined, uh, will have some characteristic path length, which for small world network varies as log of the number of nodes in the network, which is kind of a constant for a network. And uh, if we have some entity which is spreading in a network, uh, say SI model or SIR model, some epidemic spreading model, so we can find out how the uh, epidemic is spreading with respect to time and then it achieves a steady state value or it uh, goes away. So we can take that peak and the value of that time and we can uh, uh, find out the analogous characteristic path length for that. Uh, Velocity in networks where the nodes varied from 500 to 2000, the velocity kind of was close to each other. So we had all kinds of networks where we had nodes from 500 to 2000, 3000 nodes. And the way the epidemic is spreading in those networks, the rate, uh, the velocity, seems to be kind of constant. So we had 1.2 is the mean and we have standard deviation from 1.4 to 0 0.8. So quite close to 1, 1.2. So and for at least 10 networks. So that was one empirical study and uh, we have a lot of epidemic spreading models already established. So we can see what we can get from there. and. Other systems like the liquid crystals, for example, in those cases we have time-dependent electric fields and magnetic fields and we have strike patterns in certain liquid crystals. So in those patterns we can find out uh, the length scale from the patterns and because we are uh, producing, we are providing uh, time-dependent electric and magnetic fields, so we know the frequency. So there has to be some connections. and. Some of the recent researches on Casimir effect, which I came to you know like a couple of days back, so they have found some patterns in, and those patterns seem to have some relations with some characteristic constants in systems. So yeah, I mean that's all for the talk, and and thank you, Francis and the Eco Group and uh, my advisor Javano back in the United States and. Georgie, of course, and I'm working with Umberto here in Polytechnico, so he is also giving a lot of feedback as to how to connect these ideas to non-equilibrium formulations of statistical mechanics, which is which seems like a very important problem to solve. And of course, Worcester Polytechnic Institute for the funding to spend three months in Europe. Thank you. questions. So this is the first time I am presenting these ideas to anybody other than my advisor, of course. So it uh, looks quite promising. Uh, oh, you're now running on is a battery power. Do you have a charger? It's the computer. Yeah. I the computer. computer. Okay. It's not too... <laughs> sure. <laughs> my memory again. Uh, but you speak about characteristic lengths and characteristic time scales, yes. but does that give you any indication, for example, in the Bernal phenomenon of the size of the convection cells? So how yes. do you interpret it? Yes, yes, because uh, we can find out the 
Yes, actually, because uh, when we have a thermal image of a profile, we can do a line cut or a area distribution and we can count the number of cells there and we can zoom in on a specific cell and we can find out the dimension of that cell. Like yeah, I've recently seen such photographs uh, where you can nicely see the, 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 yes. the, the colors of the, colors, different, yeah, the yeah, yeah. temperatures. I used them in another talk where I gave an example of the Benar convection. So I'm quite interested that you might be able to calculate yes. those things. And we can float some particle and we can trace the motion of that particle. Ah, yeah, like that and also. we can find out the frequency. We can make a movie. Uh -huh, yeah, we yeah. can make a movie and yeah. uh, from there we can find out the velocity of that particle. Because we know the film, film thickness. But we, uh, there are no other models that predict those things? Or? Uh, frequency is something which um, people haven't done. Mm -hmm. with respect to Bernard cells. Yeah. This is a problem, like when we talk about thermodynamics, people have talked about uh, time rate change of quantities, they haven't talked about spatial distribution. We have rate of change of entropy, but we do not have uh, the spatial dependence of entropy. And when we talk about Bernard cells, we have the spatial distribution of things, but we do not have the time dependence of things. Ah, yeah. yeah. So, like there are loopholes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I suppose there are models that can predict the size of the cells, yes. but without taking into account the dynamics. Dynamics, yeah. yeah. While you connect it to... I connect the both of them. But uh, you only do it for the stationary state, you don't yes. have it for the emergence no, of the stationary no, no, state. No. We have some ideas because, uh, as I told you, like in case of simulations, we ran a couple of simulations. So. Say, uh, when we have a system which we know that, uh, we know what should be the least action state. That means the system is deterministic, so we can calculate. And we know that if it is a completely random state, so we have the normal distribution of states. So we know that there are two probability distribution functions. One is the delta function, because there is only one and only one state and one is the normal distribution curve. So there is a shift which happens from a normal distribution gradually to a delta function. And we found this in case of the kind of a Yes, of the kind of glass curve. Yeah. And it's not actually symmetrical uh, from both sides. It usually is we have the delta function here and we have the normal distribution here. It goes like this. Oh, and it goes like this and, and becomes like this. And uh, we found this in case of both uh, uh, the simulations that we ran and also in case of the Bernard cells. So what we did is we tried to find out the thermal variation of the temperature when there was no heat and when the system achieved a steady state with patterns. And we found that when there was no heat, everything was random, it was a normal distribution. And when there was patterns, it was skewed, some kind of poison or log normal kind of distribution. We, and uh, so my advisor also has another student who works in uh, biophysics and statistical mechanics. So she works with proteins and stuff and uh, in proteins and droplets in liquid crystals. So when there is some evaporation happening, so we have certain patterns in case of our research as well. But she is looking into completely different aspect. But we did similar analysis with those things and we also found that uh, there is a shift of distribution function from normal and gradually through a log normal to a delta function. So we know that the distribution function changes, but how it changes, the dynamics is still unknown. And this clearly tells us that there is a, a renormalization of the partition function, the phase space, because it's evolving with time because of the fluxes. And how this is happening is still an open question. That is why it's difficult to... These things are difficult. But I mean, I'm, I'm interested because I recently gave a talk on a conference on uh, quantum entanglements, yeah. where I tried to make 
uh, an analogy between the phenomenon of self-organization and the collapse of the wave function, yeah. where in the case of the Bernard phenomenon, at a certain moment you have the equivalent of a collapse in the sense that you have a bifurcation, and it chooses yes. one of the two options of the bifurcation, yeah. and then it stays there. So it's this bit is probably what you describe as the, the Gaussian that then becomes collapsed to, yes. a, to a delta function. Yeah, yeah. And if we could understand that better for self-organization, mm. then maybe in quantum mechanics we could try to understand it in the same way. But in self-organization, because you're working with macroscopic systems, you have mm. more of a chance of understanding what's really happening. Exactly, exactly. So that's, uh, since, since I still have to write a paper about that presentation, I'm interested in uh, understanding more details of that mm -hmm. uh, mm. transition. Yeah, I mean... This, uh, because uh, I also go into the quantum mechanics from this approach, so uh, this this entire idea is based upon one of the paper that we just finished writing, and we are going to submit it to one of the journals very shortly, mm, and it might be on ArcSIF very soon. So this the entire basis of this paper, the mathematics and all these equations and the derivations, everything in detail is there in the paper. So. And uh, of course, there will be multiple papers where we go into much deeper connections. So, I, I can share that paper with you. I mean, mm -hmm. that will be really good if you can give some comments back. And because we talk about quantum mechanics and relationship between these things, because as I uh, showed earlier that the Lagrangian density uh, naturally evolve from the equations that we propose so in case of quantum mechanics so there has to be some connection some fundamental connection between this approach and that well no, in quantum mechanics there is a part integral formulation yes where, yes uh, yeah where you have a where you use a lagrangian to calculate the yes. probability of a yes. particular part that is that is the idea essentially which uh, i'm trying to figure out as how the transition happens between these two equilibrium points in phase space from system in equilibrium and driven out of equilibrium and how that happens as a collection of paths and how the paths are weighed so in equilibrium thermodynamics we have the states the weighing of states the Boltzmann factor basically tells you which state is more probable as compared to the other if we have a path formulation and we can find out the uh, weighing of the paths as to which path is more likely to be taken as compared to the other, and that has to have some connections with the entropy dissipation or dissipative effects to bring in the second law into picture. So these are some of the speculative ideas. Yeah, but the paths, the problem is that there are so many degrees of freedom of yes, thought that the exactly. mathematics will become extremely complex. Exactly, exactly. Exactly. But uh, I remember that originally you were looking for a kind of a general theory of self-organization yes. where you would use the, the Lagrangian or the, the, the least action principle to try to model how the system chooses a particular organization. So the, the Bernard phenomenon is nice because it's, let's say, the first non-trivial self-organization that could possibly be modeled in this way. Yes, yes. But do you see possibilities towards more complex forms of self-organization where, for example, the, the, the different uh, cells are not the same sizes or where you have kind of non-regular hmm. non spatial patterns? There is a possibility because this talks about um, if we have uh, one system like one domain and how spatial patterns appear or emerge in that domain. Currently that we have the theory, or that, that is the theory that I propose. What if we have multiple set of domains and how those domains are interacting with each other? Like in you know, the example that you said, like if, if we have uh, cells, like living cells for example. Each living cell is complex and a collection of living cells is also complex. But uh, there has to be a uh, different or maybe a similar approach to tackle both the problems. So this theory I, right now uh, tells us how to tackle the problem of one cell. 
and from one to a set of cells that is uh, but I just thought maybe of a possible intermediate case. I would I don't know whether it would work, but with the Benin phenomenon, you typically yeah. assume that there is a homogeneous temperature difference between the bottom and the yes. top. Yes. What if the temperature difference was not homogeneous? Let's say here there is more heat than there. Mm. Then you might expect that the pattern of cells will not be homogeneous. Exactly. But we maybe saw that. here the cells will be smaller, and here they will be bigger. We saw that. We saw that actually. We saw that. Because yeah. Whenever we are heating a plate, we are not heating it uniformly, however hard you try to. Even if with the best conducting material, if you try to heat it, there is never a uniform heat distribution. And we saw that. There were uh, temperature sinks, and mm -hmm. those were like bright spots. And the uh, temperature in those regions would be fluctuating like rapidly as compared to the other region. Not only that, even the potential energy, because it has to be completely flat, or the surface has to be flat. If there is a slight inclination, the cells start arranging in a different way. Ah, yeah, that's true. Actually, if if if, if you would have a, a surface area like that, yes, then you would have different, different cells yeah, and different those thickness changes. Everything. But but, but do you think that your formalism could eventually describe this kind of phenomena? It 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 should be because we talk about one dimension. Mm -hmm. So if we have multiple dimensions, then we have three vectors and then I don't know how to measure these things right now because even we haven't done any measurements like accurate measurements for one dimensional case but we have but, some but wouldn't that be the simplest case if you have a, a one dimensional yeah. uh, banal convection but where the distance between surface and bottom is varies not. continuously yeah. That might be maybe doable with your formula. Yes, 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 yes. And, be and, and then you could do experiments to see whether to it's see how, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's correct. Yeah. I mean, if the size of the cells varies according to a particular function and you can predict that function, that function, nice. yeah. Yes. So, so basically the length scale is not, uh, I mean, it, it is dependent on another spatial uh, axis, I can say. And then we have a function, maybe a smooth function or increasing linear function. Yeah, we can do that actually. Yes, yeah, th these are the possibilities of future work, which, uh, as I said, like various variations of the Bernard cells, because it's a very simple system and which we can tweak in many different aspects. And things can also be calculated. And measure. This has always been one of my favorite examples of yes. self organization. Yes. <laughs> it's one of the oldest. Uh, one of the term, oldest yeah. and one of the, the, yeah, the nicest to show and to demonstrate because you can understand it intuitively why exactly. you start to get the cells. Exactly. But then to calculate them, that's not trivial. Mm, th and that's not a trivial thing. Yeah. No. But uh, the, the, the main innovation, let's say, to and each of them, so when is an equilibrium system, these go to zero, this goes to zero, and we have this. In case of out of equilibrium steady state, we have these two constants. And each of them is basically individually the energy conservation principle. As energy is conserved. So this is what I claim that. The most important uh, thing in the paper or in the presentation. And we arrive at this because of the uh, uh, Lagrangian written in terms of temperature and degree of temperature instead of Q and Q dot. Uh, the, the, the derivation of the temperature, uh, derivation by what? By a uh, spatial dimension? Yeah, yeah, this is uh, mu is the usual uh, P, X, Y, Z. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a four dimensional. Yeah, four dimensional. Yeah. Prime and P, double prime and all, and P 
zero and t is equal to five. But we also can have couple terms where we have del square t by del x del y, or we can have del square t by del x del t, or similar terms. And we are not taking into account of these things right now. Because if we do this, then uh, it, it becomes much more complicated. Of course, yeah. And uh, the interesting thing is, if we incorporate these things, then we might have uh, curl components. Because this is essentially taking the curl of the temperature, or the derivative of temperature. So this will also have the angle of this minus e. So with respect to x, with respect to y, and with respect to y, and then again with respect to x. So. Uh, but what's the exact connection between the first law and the least action principle? So once we uh, define this, and this is the Lagrangian density. Yes. And then we minimize the action, which is L So once we minimize the action, so we solve the Euler Lagrange equation, and the Euler Lagrange equation gives us the equation of motion. In case of mechanics, it's the trajectory between two states. In case of thermodynamics, 